Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a great conversation ahead about technology, connection, how our digital worlds have evolved, especially over the past year. I want to introduce some of our fabulous panelists that will be joining me in this conversation. We have Mike Hondorp from Cameo, Renee Miller from Code and Theory, Josh Beatty from Yamamoto, Ashish Tashnishnwal from Y Media Lab, and then I am Sarah Fisher, your moderator from Axios. Welcome everyone. So I wanted to just start this conversation off thinking about being connected and also being disconnected. It's really hard to figure out where we have the break between being on and being off. But I also think that that provides opportunities for a lot of people in marketing and creative and technology in that it allows us to figure out how can we build products so that they're really meaningful when we're on and that they allow us to take a reprieve when we're off. Let's start with Mike from Cameo. Mike, Cameo was the perfect product that was built for this moment. It allows people to connect with their favorite artists and celebrities, but to do so in a really refined and personalized way. It's such a different relationship than, you know, tuning into a television show where you're so remote from that celebrity. Walk us through what the past year has looked like for your company and how you're thinking about this sort of always on, always off uh, world that we're living in. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And um, for those not familiar with Cameo, Cameo is the personalized celebrity shout out uh, app site uh, platform, essentially, that has seen, I hate to say the word, unprecedented growth uh, in 2020. Um, we were certainly on quite a trajectory prior to the pandemic, but if anything, the pandemic accelerated our use case, our business, and, and the way in which people connect. And I think that's just tapped into the insight of people craving a craving connection with other people whether it be friends or the celebrities they know and love and so you know we saw a roughly 400 percent growth in our business in 2020 and we're seeing that trajectory continue as we emerge from this pandemic and i just think it comes down to connection so the mission of cameo um, again perfectly positioned for a time when people are are craving connection is to create the most personal and authentic fan connections on earth. And the way that I actually translate that in a simpler term is making impossible connections possible. And so without Cameo, it's pretty hard to imagine, especially amidst a pandemic, but really anytime a celebrity talking to you directly, unless you were to randomly run into somebody at a restaurant or on the streets of New York, um, with Cameo, you can get a personalized message on your phone uh, that says your name, knows who you are, what you're interested in, what the celebration is you may be, you may be celebrating, what the occasion is you may be celebrating. So it's, it's the personalized nature of the Cameo experience that I think has really set us up for continued success. And I think in a time when artists and celebrities are a little less involved in their day-to-day -day work, they're seeing this as, as an amazing place with which they can stay connected to the people that keep their careers going. Um, and again, it all comes down to like that personalized nature of the experience that we afford. Um, and we're super excited to kind of continue to build the products and solutions that we have that even forge those connections a little stronger. Mike, you bring up a good point, which is that during the pandemic, there were so many opportunities for celebrities to lend their time uh, to doing this type of thing because they weren't out there. Production was shut down on a lot of shows. They themselves couldn't leave their houses. So how do you anticipate Cameo evolves when lockdown restrictions start to ease, when people start to go outside and potentially when celebrities have a little bit of less free time? Yeah, it's interesting. I think I think all of our projections, uh, both from the supply and the demand side, are painting a very rosy picture for Cameo. Of course, we're realists, and you, you know that could all come to a crashing halt. We're not totally sure. But ultimately, I think the way in which we've connected with both talent and fans in 2020 and even prior, um, people who are new to the platform are like, oh, wow, this is really a place where I can, I can connect, right? And it's just as rewarding for the talent as it is for the fans. I mean, we, our KPI as a company is actually, sometimes I think it's a bit of a cheesy term, but it's real when you actually witness it. It's these magical moments. It's that emotional reaction that is the response to getting a personalized message from somebody you've looked up to or have thought about for years, but have never had the chance to meet. And so as we emerge from the pandemic, um, 
I think our team is simultaneously iterating on products to, to translate the Cameo experiences to more use cases. So right now, essentially, a Cameo is a pre-recorded celebrity shout out that says, hey, Mike, I know it's your birthday. No, you're a huge Office fan. Let's pretend I'm Brian Baumgartner. Um, and just so thrilled to wish you a happy birthday and you know, keep watching the reruns, yada, yada, yada. Um, let's say I'm just, you know, he's my number one fan. I love that pre-recorded message. What I want more is a live experience with him. And so we're iterating products within the Cameo ecosystem to create real-time live one-to-one -one experiences. A product that has launched but is still in its relative infancy is called Cameo Calls. And it's really interesting. It's basically a scaled one-by-one -one FaceTime experience that happens within the Cameo app where fans are able to meet these people face-to-face -face for a set amount of time. They get a selfie at the end of it that's downloaded to their camera, branded Cameo calls. Um, and it's a memento that they get to keep forever. Interestingly, I think from a personal perspective is that talent are finding this one of their favorite experiences within the Cameo ecosystem because they're like, I literally don't get to meet my fans outside of maybe a red carpet. And is that really meeting somebody or just saying hi? Um, and so I just think ultimately pandemic or no pandemic, humans crave connection. And even if, if that connection is virtual, it's, it's still relatively impossible, right? Um, to, to have these strong connections um, without this device. And I think we're just gonna con continue to see that scale. So stay tuned, but um, really excited to see more product iterations for sure. I am so excited to finally get on one of those calls and to have it to download, I think is a perfect memento to your point. I wanna bring it to Renee to piggyback on something that you said, Mike, which was talking about personal connections. I feel as though in the pandemic, a lot of people have had to go through a lot and they were often isolated from friends. They were isolated from family. And so what they were looking for is a sense of connection. But Renee, you know this better than anyone else. Sometimes when you turn on your television, it's hard to get a sense of connection with every brand, with every television show, because they're not all inclusive. They're not all able to create new creative at this moment to meet the moment because production was shut down in the beginning. What did you see happen over the past year? How did creative evolve so that we could eventually address this moment with more inclusivity, with more personalization? And what is the impact if brands don't or didn't go in that route? Yeah. Oh, those are great questions. Okay. I think uh, Mike said it really crisply, which is pandemic or no pandemic, people create crave connections, right? And um, the reality is uh, television has always been a medium that makes it hard to feel a one-to-one -one con connection. But during the pandemic and during this time, it's sort of become clear what platforms are a one-to-one -one connection and where it is that we can spend the time. So, uh, you know, television productions were shut down, commercial productions were really hard to to get off the ground, but what was really easy was to continue the podcast medium. What was really easy was to be smart on social, was to be smart about how you utilized, you know, uh, snackable content and where you put it on your own owned ecosystem. I think part of the beauty of a brand is that brands got to decide in this moment, what is your value to your consumer? Now here's the deal, here's the trick you brand watching, <laughs> like, let's not even get uh, philosophical. Let's be very specific, brand watching. It is very important that you tell your consumer what your value is in their life. We can't all be Wendy's. Everybody knows what the value of a Frosty is in their personal life. You know when you need one. We can't all be Skittles. Everybody knows when they need a Skittle, when they need to go to the store and get themselves up. But I no, don't necessarily know where your brand has value in my life unless you tell me. And so I think the thing that we've seen be the most successful, be the most impactful with creating connection that one-to-one -one connection with your consumer is deciding what your value is. So are you going to entertain them? Are you going to soothe them? Are you going to align to their values? And even if you soothe, entertain, or align to my values, if you never tell me what role you play in my life, what role your brand plays in my life, then I don't know what role you play you were funny, thank you so much for this content and I will keep it pushing. So you don't only have to be thumb stopping, you also have to tell me where it is that I go and where it is that you serve me. And I think we've seen a lot of brands do that really well.
So this might be a weird question, but how do brands know how they serve different individuals? Is it by developing that personalized one-to-one -one connection? Is it by doing market research? And once you do find out where you fit in each individual's life, how do you communicate to them that specific message? Because I feel as though personalized ads, even it gets really tricky to do that. It sure does. I mean, listen, I will say it, as much as it's a, it's a big terrifying answer, the answer is data. You need data. You need that first party data. And that really drives home the, the, the point that like data isn't always inclusive. Sometimes when you get a data point, and this is the difference between a good agency and a great agency. This is the difference between a good thought partner and a wonderful and a brilliant thought partner. When you get data, data is typically white and it is typically male. So when you see data points, you really have to ask yourself, who did this data come from? Who is this data for? And how do I utilize this in a way that actually speaks to who my consumer is? I think that is sort of the secret sauce of code in theory is really reading the humanity back into the data, really putting that person, that consumer back at the center of this data point and really using that to drive how we tell a story. And that is the key for a brand, not just taking the data, but putting the humanity back into it and really pushing forward as a brand. How do you organize and tell that story. So that means how you personalize for me is going to be different from how you personalize for Sarah, for Mike, for Josh, for Stephanie, et cetera, right? Personalization and optimization isn't a Band-Aid that you put on top of a problem that you don't know how to fix. Personalization and optimization is when you get specific in solving your consumer's needs and solving your consumer's barriers. And that, that really requires knowing and understanding who your consumer is. It's a very daunting task. And I think one of the lessons learned for most companies, agencies during the pandemic is every company now is a data company, regardless of whether or not you thought of yourselves as one. Absolutely. I want to uh, circle this conversation to Josh, because when Renee and I were talking, I mean, we mostly touched on um, some of the new age social apps, ways to communicate one-to-one, -one, talked about advertising. But what we haven't talked about is this whole new frontier of mixed reality, things like AR and VR and mixed media. And I worry, Josh, that if we can't get some of these conversations around connection right in the two-dimensional world, how are we going to make sure that the stuff we're building for the future, again, the, those technologies that you work in, especially you know, with AR, VR, are gonna be able to get it right? Uh, what are you seeing in that space? What makes you optimistic that companies are being mindful about ways to have inclusive connections? Uh, that's a great question. And I think truly important because when we go from computing on our phone to spatial computing everywhere, the amount of permissions and privacies that you have to confront really exponentiate. So, you know, to, to kind of roll back in terms of where we're at, a lot of companies want to uh, take your data and try to control you by pushing certain ads uh, into your inbox or onto your screen. I think that we're really at a turning point, um, you know, with Microsoft's OS 14 uh, limiting privacy with our cookie-less future. We're really coming to the point where people want to have control and want to be controlled less. And I think that when we start to unfold that into our real world, that's going to become even more controlled through the permissions, through the privacy, and through the transparent approach that companies take in terms of helping you understand that value equation from giving your uh, information and not just being a product at the end of the day. And okay, so let's go back at that. Obviously, there's this trend where people want more you know, control over their data, but you have a lot of companies that are kind of pushing back on it. I mean, you know, you have a lot of com companies that are creating sort of workarounds to the cookie-less future with something like a unified ID. You have a lot of companies that are lobbying Apple's changes saying like, no, that's going to hurt our business. So if you're a company that relies on database advertising, how are you going to be able to, even if you are like an ARVR company, how are you going to be able to sort of tow this line of your business revolves around data, but your consumers might not necessarily want to be tracked as much? Uh, I think that it is a transparent value equation. The customer needs to understand what they're getting by giving that data away. And if they're getting a better experience, you know that that is something that people will be willing to give their information for. If you're getting something for free, 
again, that's something that people will give their information for. And so people just don't want to be tricked. You know, I, I think that we're willing to give a good amount away if we know what we're getting from that. So making that very clear, having permissions that you can then control, um, especially as we, you know, take this physical and digital divide and really bring it everywhere. We're bringing this into situations that have never been brought in before. And so whether that's facial recognition, whether that's, you know, uh, taking, you know, scans of an environment and bring it to the cloud, all that needs to be worked through in, in a way that makes people feel like it's not just big brother trying to creep in, uh, in a way that is scary. So just to follow up with you on that quickly, and sorry, my video just went out really fast. When it comes to some of these digital experiences, I'm also seeing this kind of weird trend of people that are sort of backing away from the you know, hyper-personalized experience because they feel like it's really creepy. You're starting to see a lot of ads for just like get out in the wilderness, you know, be away from your phone. Apple is sending you how much screen time you are spending on your phone every week. Is there a world if we don't get this right that you think people are just going to start to shift away from tech? I think that it is a very important point that we're at right now. Um, there was an article in the Financial Times talking about how even with all the data that companies have, advertising is still super crappy. You know, that's it. And so really, what are we giving from this, you know, transferring of data? And I, I think that if we try to just get deeper into people's lives, mm -hmm. again, machine learning is, I see it as kind of that, um, sorry for the, sound coming out from outside, but it's really that needle on a record. And, you know, machine learning likes to just push down harder into that groove. And I think we're coming to that point where, you know, discovery is super important for people. And, and if you're stuck in this groove, you just kind of feel like you're seeing the same thing over and over. And so there needs to be a way. And I think companies are starting to realize this, that we want to kind of hop out of this groove, hop out of this machine learned, you know, place that we've been put in and really have a, a way of discovering things that aren't suggested to us, but more that we can explore and, you know, participate in and discover, you know, for better or worse. So it's, it, it comes back to what customers want, you know, whether they want more of the same or whether they want kind of that freedom to kind of feel life as it comes at you. Yep. And figuring out what customers want comes back to what Renee was saying. You need to invest in data and having those conversations with them. Let's go to you, Stephanie. One question I have that kind of follows up to what Josh and I were just talking about is there's all this innovation coming from Silicon Valley, digital products, et cetera. But consumers have a trust problem right now in Silicon Valley. You're seeing this awkward uh, dichotomy where there's so much value in the products. There's so much distrust in some of the values themselves coming from companies there. So your company is trying to kind of export the values in the world and the innovation of Silicon Valley to the rest of the world. Do you ever get to a point where the rest of the world is saying to you, hey, slow down. Like, we don't know that we're ready for all of this change. And then we don't know if those values align with ours. It's a great question. And just for context for everyone, um, you know, at YML, we're building the apps and websites that customers use every day. And, you know, the ones that power many of these businesses that we're talking about here. Um, and Sarah, you're completely right. I'm actually a pretty diehard New Yorker. So when I talk about our exporting of Silicon Valley, it's important to talk about what that means. And for us, it's about innovation and velocity. Um, there is definitely the pushback. Um, you know, we're talking about things like big data and big tech, and these subjects have been brought up um, with regards to transparency. At YML, we've actually worked with Google on their TensorFlow technology, which is a machine learning technology that does image recognition, speech recognition, um, you know, and really figuring, uh, actually doing some of the training materials for that. But like mentioned on you know, this discussion, it's the transparency and how that's being presented to users and being very honest about the shortcomings of that technology, what it can and can't do, how it's being used and giving users the ability to opt into it and being able to use the technology that really builds that trust as a brand and also um, you know, continues to make sure that consumers are fully aware. Another really good example of this and also um, you know, a, a public or I should say another good company that I think is doing well with this is the company called Public 
public and we're actually speaking to their CEO. We have a podcast and they're coming on to talk about it. Um, public has had a huge uprising after um, you know the incidents with Robinhood a few weeks back. One of the reasons being is that they've moved to more of a tipping methodology for using their trading platform versus one that works with the clearing houses on the back end. So Sarah, I look at that as a really good example of you know saying, Yes, there might be pushback. Technology does need to be used with caution, but let us explain to you how and why your data is being used and make sure that you have the option to have some control here. Um, Because it's when you don't do that and when you don't really know what you're giving up that you get into hairy water or yeah, (laughs) deep water as they say. (laughs) Sorry, I'm muted. One of the tough things though about the control that I struggle with is I recognize that all these companies are trying to give me control. Do you accept cookies? Do you not accept cookies? But the problem is sometimes they ask me to scroll through like pages and pages and pages of long privacy agreements to the point where I don't even feel like it's a real true value exchange. I don't have time realistically to read every little piece of data that you're going to collect from me. But if I need to know in the moment, a quick fact, I'm just going to click accept or, you know, I guess not accept. So are there ways that we can help consumers make these decisions without it being so impossible to make them thoroughly? Absolutely. Um, A really good example of how we've done this is our work with Thrive Market. Um, They're a great grocery retailer um, and really had this huge uh, research, or I should say upswing during the pandemic because so many people were ordering groceries to home and they have a really great um, product line of sustainable groceries. Um, And, you know, sort of what Renee talked about, it's all about accessibility in that sense. No one wants to sit down and read a laundry list of terms and conditions. And furthermore, not everyone has the ability to do that. So how can you present things as to, I want to allow for you to advertise to me, yes or no. I'm comfortable with you taking information on my dietary habits so that you can recommend products to me that make sense, yes or no, and really breaking those down. And I do think the companies that are going to succeed are the ones that really start to be think in those ways and realize that no one wants to be tricked, no one wants to be trapped. It's okay for this to be a part of your business. It's completely acceptable. Consumers do have understanding there, but they don't have patience for trickery and they don't have patience for long forms. I agree with that. I often feel as though the value exchange is not so transparent and I feel like I'm being tricked in some way and those types of apps really, or companies really, really bother me as a consumer. Um, I wanna quickly bring it back to Renee. You know, one of the things that I've been struggling with at this point in the pandemic is there's now so many apps, so many mediums, audio and social and connected TV that brands can reach consumers that I feel like I almost have to be almost on. And even with work too, you know, when you're having so many different mediums to talk to people and you're stuck at home, it's almost like you're being, you know, overwhelmed with the amount of channels. What does your data show consumers are feeling and how do you recommend brands, uh, companies and consumers kind of figure out a better balance so that they're not overwhelmed by so much innovation and new opportunities? That's such a great question. That's such a great way to think about it. And I think when I, um, you know, when we talk about at Coded Theory, when we talk to brands, when we talk about what is needed, especially in this moment for the consumer, it really is focused on the consumer. So often we talk to brands about what a brand needs. Well, you need to establish yourself as X. You need to make sure that you're cornering the market on Y. And what is most important is what the consumer needs in this moment. And uh, for quite a few brands, we, you know, depending on what your like, you know, depending on your awareness level, depending on if your goals are conversion or if your goal is to sort of build loyalty, depending on the brand's goals. But like oftentimes we tell our brands, it's really important to offer your consumer something that they are needing right now. And consumers right now feel like they're being yelled at not because every text message is coming in in all caps, but because I'm getting a text and a Slack message and a Zoom call and a FaceTime and an email all at the same time and a DM and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're all coming through at the same time. There is not a moment when the push notifications on our phones has stopped. We don't get that pause. And so instead a brand can act as that pause. It could be as simple as all of your content is sort of memeable, fun, funny, injecting humor into a time when consumers are extremely stressed. Or it could be you take the flip of that 
and you inject some some calm and a pause moment into what is an incredibly cluttered and incredibly uh, loud and bright and jarring newsfeed on every single platform, rather than be additional jarring, you can also add moments of calm. And so you see a lot of brands sort of um, with a lot of like waving trees in the background or the lapping ocean, really injecting a moment of pause and as a consumer, I mean, I bet if you're uh, every consumer now will not, you cannot not see it. You'll never not see it now. But like as a consumer, you really do have a moment where your jaw unclenches, your shoulders go down. And if the brand bringing it to you consistently has your jaw unclench and your shoulders go down, all of a sudden you've created a, a connection and a one-to-one -one with the consumer in a way that was unexpected. And now you're building some loyalty. Now you've got some room and some rope to have a conversation with them. So really it's about deciding what value it is you need to play in your consumer's life. And by and you have to do that by really digging into the data and learning who your consumer is. Yeah, I feel like that thought of disarming the consumer, like upfront, letting them know we're not trying to be an invasive experience, trying to make your life better. It's so critical, especially when we think about immersive technologies, going back to Josh, you know, I've done some of the, you know, AR goggles and I've done some of these immersive worlds. And one of the most challenging parts about it is it's very hit or miss. If it's a really immersive and thoughtful experience, it can be wonderful. Other times it can feel like glitchy and confusing. How do you guys think about creating a really rewarding and pleasant experience for consumers as opposed to one where it feels like confusing and is this how I'm supposed to be perceiving this new technology? I'll take it. So yeah, I, I think a, a lot of that is, is you, VR and AR are two different things. Um, so I, I guess you kind of have to tackle one and then tackle the other. With VR, uh, it's all about guiding the user. Um, you know, I think that uh, a while ago, VR movies were a thing, but the, what people didn't realize is that the director is the most important part of a movie. The director helps guide you along that story, tells you where to focus on, what's important, um, and you know makes that those transitions very easy for the viewer. When you're in VR, you actually become the director. And so if you're kind of not quite sure what to focus on, that story becomes very jarring, very fragmented, and you lose the user right away. Um, in AR, it, it's more of bringing content to context. So understanding the context of the experience um, and how content can then play a role to elevate that experience is kind of that more important thing. And so it, we, we like to kind of mix everything together into this mixed reality realm. Um, but they are kind of two different things, kind of like anything we do in marketing. It, it all depends on you know, first the customer, you know, then the, the, the channel, and then kind of really what you want to bring from a story perspective to then kind of align those things into something that makes sense. When you're talking about the story perspective, how do you come up with stories for an immersive world? Is it different than when you're coming up with a story for a two-dimensional world? Uh, first, you need these experiences to be short. Um, because, you know, the, the amount of time that people spend in them is limited. So you want to make sure that you kind of are, are able to kind of bring them through in, in a way that does kind of tie it off within, you know, five to 10 minutes, uh, where, you know, on a 2D screen, you know, people, you know, they may be paying attention, they, they may be doing something else, so they kind of can come in and out of it, they don't have to be wholly absorbed. So I think it's just, you know, uh, an understanding that you have to be respectful of people's times, uh, you have to be very explicit in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Um, and, and you have to rely on, you know, creativity to create moments that do, you know, create that pause, but then bring in something new and exciting in a way that, you know, you can't really get today. Yeah. One of the questions that we got from one of the folks watching today is about humor. Like how do you integrate humor at such a polarizing time? And, you know, every medium is a, going to tackle this in a different way. You know, on Facebook with text, humor can be really challenging. But in an app mic like Cameo, humor is a central part of what you do. Can you walk us through the value of humor at a time 
where people are really stressed while people are at home? And do you ever worry that given this sort of hyper-political environment, one of the folks that's uh, on Cameo, one of your celebrities, might be trying to be funny and connect with someone, but it could come off in a way that actually creates a content moderation headache for you? So great question. And I'll, I'll first kind of cover off on the humor piece. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, everybody likes to laugh, right? And that's a good insight. Um, but, but they have to be laughing for the right reasons um, and perhaps not laughing at something, but laughing with something, et cetera. So it's interesting, one of our more popular categories. So when you go to Cameo and you book a Cameo from a celebrity, you can choose a variety of things. You can search talent who are great at pep talks. You can search talent who are great at roasts, which obviously falls into the comedy, ta uh, comedy uh, category. Um, and we find that that's one of the most prevalent ones that people are booking because being able to get somebody to laugh is essentially an amazing thing, A, as a recipient, but B, especially at this time when we're, again, craving something lighthearted, something that feels relevant and fun. I mean, essentially, humor is one of the kind of driving forces of the cameo experience, um, even when it's not necessarily from a comedian. And I think, you know, again, the cameo experience can be very controlled by the person booking that cameo or seeking that experience. Um, and we also, just as a note, have interesting ways in which talent can dig for more information before completing a request to make sure that person is staying in the right lane. Did I understand this correctly, et cetera. Um, but going beyond humor, I think generally kind of a reason why Cameo quote unquote works, um, not just for fans, but also when brands tap into the Cameo ecosystem to tell stories via our talent or perhaps even their own that they bring onto Cameo. It goes back to where I started, which is this idea of a magical moment. So to take, take a step back, each week we have a all hands as, as the entire company, we're about 200 people today and 90 minutes of every week is spent together. And one of the first three slides of our weekly all hands is the cameo of the week and the reaction of the week. And we watch those as an entire company to tap into what we're doing and how we're delivering on our mission. The reaction of the week, nine times out of 10, is either getting people in hysterics, tears, laughter, or some sort of emotional reaction. The reason I bring up that reaction piece is like, this is the driver of Cameo's business. We are making these magical moments. And for a consumer, if it's from their friend or from a celebrity for a birthday, that's amazing. You'll never forget it. When a brand's involved, tapping into that emotion is key to driving action. And so stepping, like I came into Cameo from spending two years at an influencer platform and then many years on the Instagram side of things. And ultimately we had this insight that you know, creativity is amazing. Creativity is a driver of some of the best work out there, but it's not great unless it elicits an emotional reaction. If there's an emotional reaction, that, that actually creates what we call an encoded memory. It's not just brand recall, it's something you'll never forget. And that is what drives consumer behavior. That is what drives purchase. That is what drives brand affinity. And so humor is one of those things, but tears can be the other. Um, you know, just delight in the most general way can be another. And I think ultimately, if you're marketing correctly, you're marketing to elicit, not in, a, not in a sketchy way, but in a very real and empathetic way, an emotion from your consumers. And if you've done that effectively, um, box checked, I think. And I, and I think Cameo actually offers a really interesting opportunity to do that at scale. Um, every Cameo elicits something. And I think that's really powerful if it's done right. I want to go to Stephanie real fast. The, what you just said, Mike, about emotions really is interesting because sometimes you can say something and elicit the unintentional reaction or an unintentional emotion. Um, for example, you might put something out there that you think is really funny. I recall the Burger King tweet a few weeks ago. Um, that most people don't think is funny and they find it really offensive. How do you find the way to reach out and engage people's emotions, Stephanie, without inadvertently stepping into a very awkward, unintentionally bad situation? Yeah, it's such a good question. And at YML, you know, in the spirit of exporting Silicon Valley, everything we do is really focused around speed and velocity. So that even includes testing and understanding what is the customer desires for 
humor for types of content that elicit a lot of the reactions that we're talking about. There truly is a spectrum that we see when creating content um, in service of apps, software, or other digital products. It could be as small as talking about just like, hey, or howdy on you know the text and copy side, all the way up to what Mike is talking about with really impactful brand partnerships or um, celebrity endorsements. For us, we really utilize a lot of rapid prototyping um, and mock concepting and getting it into the hands of consumers quickly to understand, are we hitting the mark or how we're not hitting the mark? There's obviously challenges when dealing with um, um, you know, current events and responding to them where you don't have the time for that feedback. Um, but we find that doing some of that testing and taking a research cycle that typically could be six or eight months long um, and really doing it quickly with like a mock prototype and eliciting some feedback quickly can really give you a good sense as to where the spectrum is for your specific customers. You know, it's so interesting on the testing and on the feedback stuff because, and I'm going to point this question to Renee, one of the folks watching our panel today just typed this question. I think it's fascinating. A lot of the testing and research, Renee, shows that digital is really efficient. You can measure it. You can optimize it. But then a ton of research also shows that some of the most calming, respectful people's time sort of mediums to communicate with people are traditional ones. You know, a traditional print ad, it's not invasive, you can just turn the page. Or, you know, even to an extent, certain linear TV spots become nationally, you know, famous and they can bring people together because we're all seeing the same message at the same time. So how do you balance using digital and to Stephanie's point, being able to measure what is going to be effective and potentially non-offensive, but with also doing it in a way that's leveraging mediums that might feel less creepy and futuristic and maybe more homey. That's so interesting. That's great. I, um, I, I will say a couple, uh, I think I, I have a couple of answers in the mix here. So like, I want to start by saying, you know, so much of the way that you avoid inadvertent offense is by making sure your inputs are right. So if you have the right inputs, your outputs will crush, right? So like at code, it's really critical that your your our client team or our project team looks like the world we're going to release this this like content into, right? So like it's really critical and really important that if you're talking to women about a women's product, that there are women on the team. It is really important that if a brand is taking a moment to in in this actual current moment today, talk about the increase in the rise in attacks on Asians. Well, how many Asian people are on our team right now? Who is raising their hand to say, I think this is an this is a critical moment and a brand should be speaking. If you if you lack the input, you will lack the output. If that right, if that's like I want to be clear about that. On top of that, so like that is where we start. On top of that, when we think about digital and you know these sorts of like, if the the direction your brand needs to go in or should go in or sees as fruitful is that sort of like soothing, um, adding a moment of calm to a really chaotic news feed or to a really chaotic platform, then there's also the flip of. Um, that's one place. It's one place that your brand exists, but and but your brand exists on all of the platforms and many platforms, and your consumer also is on all of the platforms in many of its iterations. And so you're right uh, that digital isn't the only place that you should be and isn't the only place that your brand should be showing up as soothing. Your brand should be showing up as soothing and in, in, in many of its iterations, but digital is only one place where that would happen. But I agree, right? We talk about, we think about a total ecosystem, the complete way that your brand shows up. And so like, you know, in a, in a pre-COVID world, a brand wasn't just when you walked into the store and this is this brand's place and this is the brand. The brand is the store. The brand is their Instagram. The brand is their website. The brand is your friend wearing it and talking about it. The brand is all of the things. And so it's really critical that brands think about themselves as a complete ecosystem and think about themselves in totality. And so what you do offline and what you do on digital matter and they should speak to each other and they should tell a similar story. Are you a soothing brand? Then you need to soothe me at each touch point. I wanna follow up with you quickly, Renee. We're at this moment where we're having a lot of conversations around gender, a lot of conversations around race. 
But I don't feel like the national conversation has picked up around other you know, minority populations, whether we're talking about the elderly who are being really adversely impacted by COVID, or we're talking about people with disabilities, et cetera. And my concern is that everyone seems to be following the same cultural moments at the same time. Okay, we recognize that there is this moment of anti-Asian hate and we need to address it right now. And in some ways, I worry that we're being so reactive to the moment. We're not mm -hmm. taking a step back and thinking holistically, how do we address and create a, a composite, a, a staff and a, a process that could handle and address every type of consumer at all times? Would just be curious on your take on that. Is that uh, are, are we doing it right? Should we be, you know, just reacting to the moment? Is that the right way to do it? Is there a way to build systems and processes that as marketers, we can be addressing all of these populations so that none of them ever feel like they're being left out of the conversation? What's your take? You know, uh, I don't think this is going to be a controversial take. I think there's going to be a take where everybody shakes their head. Yes. Even the people at home. But the reality is, um, who, who are your coworkers? The solve, the absolute fix, the absolute solve is who are you? Who are your coworkers? Who sits next to you on a daily basis? And if there are people who exist in this world who you know your clients are serving and you do not see them in your office on a daily basis, then you, that's a guaranteed miss. It's an absolute guaranteed miss, unless you somehow magically sit down at your desk every day and think, I know that X people are not visible in this company. Therefore, I need to represent myself and my lived experiences as well as X person and X person's lived experiences. That becomes a very difficult job for one human to do. And so it is critical. Who are your coworkers? Who are your colleagues? And when you don't see someone at the table, it's really important that you raise your hand and you say, I think... I think we have some work to do with regards to, I think we can focus on recruiting X, Y, and Z. Yeah, absolutely. I think, Josh, this is going to be a question for you. When we're thinking about these diverse populations, the other question I have is, how are we making sure all of the technologies that we're creating are accessible to every single person out there? You know, the pandemic in some ways has been a boon to new technologies like audio, for example, that have been great for certain underserved um, disabled populations. But then it's also been really hard as we're trying to see, you know, people get vaccine signups that don't have good access to internet and broadband. So when we're thinking about creating new tech, how do we bring inclusivity and accessibility uh, into that fold, especially when we're being forced to move so fast to adapt to this moment? that it feels like we don't even get to be strategic all the time. So I, great question. It does go back to Renee's answer of making sure you start with diverse perspectives. Um, I, I think there's also a big shift in technology. I mean, for a long time, we were all kind of playing with the mantra of, you know, Facebook's of, you know, move fast and break things. You know, we're, we're at the point where we're at such scale and, you know, what we're putting out online has such an impact that a lot more thought has to be put by these tech, uh, tech companies, you know, really what is the impact um, and, and think through that process uh, before they create a lot of these systems, you know, and it, thinking of AR everywhere, you know, the, the question that rattles through my mind is, you know, who really starts to own the augmented version of a physical space? Uh, because at the end of the day, we, we don't want Facebook controlling everything we do um, and offering us options, but in our Facebook profile, you know, we, we want to have the ability to create in a way that is community supportive. And, you know, when you think of community, it is, you know, understanding all the stakeholders and how they contribute to that. And so as this technology starts to roll its way out, whether that's uh, ILT, whether that's 5G, whether that's AR, that's going to affect a lot more players. And so I think that it's going to just have to be discussions at a community level of really what it means and, you know, what, what we want to do with it. Um, the COVID has been interesting though. You know, I think that it, it has done a great job of taking technology and making sure that those that don't have access do. Uh, my wife's a middle school librarian and you know, they are sending, you know, Wi-Fi, computers, tablets to, to every family that needs it. And so I think that this is an interesting time where people actually start, we have uh, 
democratize the tools. Uh, it's now making sure that they have the continued support to take advantage of those tools, you know, to, to then create to this next world. Yeah. You mentioned the platforms, which is really interesting because I've seen this dichotomy happen where we call it the tech lash at Axios, but the pressure on tech platforms to be regulated, to be accountable for all of these things, whether it's inclusivity or misinformation or bullying or harassment or hate speech, there's so much pressure on the big tech giants that I think, and I'd love to hear Mike's thoughts on this. I think it's actually given room for some of these up and coming new platforms and new technologies to walk in and say, hey, we're a breath of fresh air. We aren't loaded or we haven't faced these sort of mass scale global problems yet. You might wanna trust that our environment is a little bit more lighthearted and kind. I mean, I remember when TikTok came on the scene, they said, we're not gonna accept political advertising. We're a place for joy. Now, obviously that changes as you get bigger, but Mike, walk me through that dynamic. Do you feel as though being at Cameo you have this great opportunity to connect with people while there's a lot of scrutiny on the big platforms, or are you looking at this as a way, you know, to learn from what they're going through as you continue to build? Uh, I think it's a healthy balance. And I guess it's important to note that I worked at Facebook for seven years. Uh, the last half of that time was at Instagram. It was a vastly different world back then because I started in 2011. So you can imagine uh, we were talking to advertisers about buying fans in 2011, <laughs> and now it's essentially been one of the most uh, effective marketing channels on the planet, uh, but that has come with, with a lot of change. Um, I think right now Cameo is in an amazing place because, you know, and again, leveraging some of my experience and now seeing it from the outside, for example, with Facebook, um, the innovation there and then the innovation at a few other tech companies has in my eyes, opinion of one, stalled. Um, they're so effective at making money with what they do, innovating new net new products and experiences a la perhaps the next Cameo or the next Clubhouse or the next Snapchat stories. Um, it's a rounding error. And so that enables and opens up a possibility for, for places like Cameo to create net new experiences. Um, but I think it's important for us at Cameo to be very cognizant of seeing the changes, the potential regulations, et cetera, that are happening in the big tech space. Not that we want to avoid them necessarily, but what can we learn from that and apply that to our business model? I think the one big fundamental change between a Cameo and a Facebook, a TikTok, a Snapchat, a Pinterest, et cetera, we are not a distribution channel. While we're inherently social because it's about connection, it's not about follower counts, it's not about a feed. It's about a one-to-one -one connection. So it's a pretty different uh, use case. The second piece that's quite different and I think affords us the ability again to be a safer place, not just for, for fans, but also for, for brands is that we are not asking for much data at all. And we don't plan on leveraging user data. The data we do have, which is pretty powerful is data on our talent. We call that talent intelligence. And so, you know, if you're brand X and you're looking to talk to cohort Y, who is the best voice to tell that message? What does that person believe in? What does that person's audience think? Um, and, and that kind of data is important, but the PII piece of it is actually not really relevant to our brand and our growth, and at least in the near term. So I've gone in a few directions in answering your question, but it's, it's a good balance. It's like, what can we learn here? What is not applicable and what can we carve out that's wholly new? And frankly, I think that wholly new idea resonates really well with consumers. Um, you know, there's a reason that Clubhouse is having a moment. We'll see what happens with that. Um, there's a reason that Dispo is having a moment. It's the anti-Instagram. It's not meant to be what Instagram is. And I think there's still place for innovation. I'm just seeing a bit less of that on the big tech side in terms of the consumer products that they're launching. Um, because again, I see that kind of as a rounding error. Do we knock off the next cameo? Sure. What's it going to net us? A million bucks in revenue? What's the point? Um, yeah. <laughs> whereas cameo could establish an entirely new business and, and uh, you know, seek out the world's leading brands to do next level game changing marketing. And that could be the biggest revenue stream for our entire company. And that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's a very innovative and creative space to be. Stephanie, I want to get your take on this, and we're running low on time, so this might be our last question, which is coming from the viewpoint of Silicon Valley, 
this concept of innovation versus regulation seems really tricky. Again, you know, to Mike's point, some of the bigger players, they're, they're having to make these calculations of whether or not getting involved in something new is a rounding error. And I think part of the reason they have to make those calculations is because every time they do a new acquisition or they enter into a new field, there's so much regulatory scrutiny around whether or not they're getting too big and whether or not they're stomping out competition. Do you worry that we are getting to a point that we are, are so focused on um, sort of making sure that these big tech giants don't grow bigger, that we're going to, you know, inadvertently sort of create a world that we didn't expect? Or do you think that the direction we're heading in where there's more scrutiny over their power is good and that it allows maybe, you know, cameos and other types of companies to thrive? Yeah, it's, I agree with Mike and what he's saying where these big tech companies haven't really focused on innovation. And at the same time, you can look statistically that, you know, there hasn't been a new search engine that's really been invented in the past several years as well. Um, but I really think you need to focus the question, not necessarily on regulation, but looking at the impact that these companies can make and then subsequently the responsibility that they have. Um, if your company is looking to connect people, you know, all of Facebook and transmit information in a fast and rapid manner, you need to, on the flip side, ask yourself all these questions that we're asking here in this panel. How do I make sure that's representative of diverse viewpoints? How do I make sure the information is, success is accessible? How do I make sure it's accurate? And really focusing, and that's where the balance is, on the output um, with what your with the regulations that you yourself as a company should be putting on, you know, to make sure that you're uh, doing it in a respectful manner. Um, you know, and I think it's outside of big tech. I think you look at any startup um, that's, you know, really trying to make an impact. Um, you know, a lot of the companies that we're talking with um, on the e-commerce side, going back to that, uh, you know, an example like Thrive Market, which works with groceries, we work with Kaiser Permanente. Every time we're working uh, with these clients about gathering data and figuring out how they're going to be using that, we're also making sure that it's being done in, in a responsible way. How are you collecting it? How is it being stored? Um, how are you making sure that, you know, you're not um, doing wrong by your consumers? And it's not just a CYA move, it's actually a better way to build customer relationships by being respectful to, you know, why they're interacting with your brand and your company at the end of the day. Um, so really, you know, in summary, I think it's going back less to scale and size, but more so what's the impact you're trying to make and how are you making sure that you're doing that in a responsible and sustainable way? Yep. Less scale and size, more impact and purpose. I love it. I want to just quickly uh, thank our panelists so much. You have been so enlightening. Renee, Mike, Josh, Stephanie, and just quickly, we can wrap up some of the things that we talked about today. Mike, congratulations, Cameo, 400% growth last year, absolutely unbelievable. I think, Renee, what you said, like, you know, you need to make sure that TV, which is a hard minimum to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, still important, but you got to really explore mediums, data, where you can have more two-way conversations. Um, Josh, I love what you said about the transparent value equation. You know, not every single uh, privacy policy, cookie policy is going to make sense for every consumer, but as long as they have understand the value trade-off, they're more likely and more able to make really smart decisions around their privacy. Um, Stephanie, to your point on that, no one wants to be tricked. Completely true. Um, Renee said something really powerful, which was if you lack input, you lack output. When we were talking about how we make sure we're thinking about diversity and inclusion in all the products that we build. And then the last thing that really hit home for me, Mike, when you were talking about how creativity drives emotion and emotion is really what drives sort of brand loyalty and connection, that's something I'm going to think about a lot. I hope every time I catch a calm waving tree in the background of my apps to raise Renee's point, uh, that is reinforced because it's a great point. Uh, I want to thank the folks at Stagwell for putting this all together. Thank you so, so much for tuning in virtually today and have a great rest of your day.